Hello, my name is Malak. I'm a first year PhD student at Sultan Muley Sliman University. I will present you today my paper about artificial intelligence and the emergence of social innovation. I took for the study case the group of Kreji Agricole in Morocco. Uh, so, to start with, uh, the, con the contextualization of the paper, artificial intelligence, uh, as we know, has become the current trend not only in the digital age, but which uh, increasingly affects all sectors of our daily lives. Uh, we now see robots everywhere, domestic, assistance, uh, services, industries, everywhere. So artificial intelligence is boosting innovation in all its forms but it's becoming more coupled with the new type of innovation which appeared in 1970 and which is uh, social innovation. So as I said, the present article will give us an idea about how artificial intelligence contributes to the emergence of social impact and can impact social innovation. Uh, I want to mention also that the research conducted is not yet completed in terms of uh, uh, methodology and results and still in progress but uh, it already gave us some conclusions concerning how AI can positively disrupt uh, the human experience. Uh, why we took uh, as a case study the group of Kreji Agricole in Morocco because, because this group counts, counts on its digital transformation to participate uh, in the socio-economic development of the rural world. So, uh, we will start by the definition of artificial, of, by the definition of the key concepts, uh, which means artificial intelligence, intelligence and social innovation. And we will start by social innovation. Uh, social innovation, uh, social innovation is uh, known to be the process set up with the aim of uh, changing the usual, the usual practices in order to respond. Uh, to a social situation uh, concerned as uh, unsatisfactory at a given time in a given place. Uh, social in innovation is a vague concept, it's a new concept, and uh, researchers uh, uh, found some difficulties in defining it. So we will uh, select three definitions. First one is social innovation is often confused with concepts like the social economy, social entrepreneurship, and social businesses, and so on. Social inno innovation is known to be a tool for mod modernizing social policies, which we are used to following and sharing in public. And social innovation is a reconciliation between the economy and the society to achieve a, miss a mission that will serve it. Uh, also, uh, we will mention here three definitions, each presented from a different perspective following the analysis by Kluge. Uh, this analysis focused social innovation on three components, uh, namely the individual, the environment and the company. So, uh, moving to the definition of artificial intelligence, uh, we know that artificial intelligence is uh, a game changer, is, uh, uh, it's, it's the technology that uh, exercises or practices the tasks that uh, basically defined to be human tasks. So we can uh, put forward here a good theory related to artificial intelligence, which is the Basilic theory of Rocco. This theory demonstrates the irrational fear of some people about artificial intelligence, which means that in the future, an overpowered artificial intelligence will be able to punish us if we didn't contribute to its development. So uh, this is concerning the key concepts in social innovation and artificial intelligence. We will move now to the case study about the Kreji Agricole group of Morocco. Uh, he, here we will, we will see how the use of digital technologies contributes to solving concrete problems, especially issues related to financial inclusions, inclusion. And uh, this is the objective of the group. Uh, Kriji Agricole of Morocco emphasized the promotion of people excluded from the banking system, for example. 
and uh, we will see how this group was able to, to size the opportunity of innovation and digital technology to achieve social innovation. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, when artificial intelligence comes to launch digital innovations, it is with the ultimate goal of solving social and environmental problems. And this is uh, the objective of the group, uh, like digital pro platforms that facilitate peer-to-peer -peer interactions, citizen engagement platforms, crowdfunding platforms, launched with the aim of supporting social project projects. So uh, we are now increasingly seeing calls for projects in social innovation using artificial intelligence. Uh, action on the social and solidarity economy. Uh, this group was uh, rewarded was uh, rewarded many times. Uh, first of all, it's a socially responsible bank, which strongly marks its presence on the axis of entrepreneurial support by encouraging initiatives based on collective projects, advocating human uh, values, and having the common good as an ambition. It's, it's a group in Morocco, but we also have Credit Agricole in France, for example. Uh, so, as I said, it's a group that has been awarded uh, toward its commitment to a dis dis digitalization process. I'm sorry. Uh, so, these awards, for example, rewarded the bank's awardness, which has seized the opportunity, as I said, of innovation and digital technology to emerge and offer its customers the opportunity to benefit from banking services even when they are, for example, uh, installed in rural areas. Because uh, to explain, the most of or the majority of the customers of this group are farmers and are agriculturals and not, they are not installed in cities, they are installed in uh, rural uh, areas and rural uh, regions. So the objective or the goal uh, for the group is to make the, the, the banking services accessible to them and in general accessible to everyone, everywhere. So for that, uh, the, the group uh, started to implement an information system and uh, launched new applications in e-banking. And uh, he launched also smart agencies, mobile payment solution, so the so uh, that the group can create a proximity with uh, its customers uh, installed, as I said, in the rural and agricultural world. For example, uh, or we will move now to concrete actions uh, done by the group, uh, wishing to achieve a stronger impact. Uh, the, the, the group uh, participated in 2019 uh, in the International Agriculture Show in Morocco, SIAM, uh, 2019, and created a space dedicated to young leaders of innovation projects called the, Digit the Digital Farm Factory. It's a great novelty which reflected the strategic orientations of the bank. And it also uh, created a space dedicated to guidance and information for young people in the creation of small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. So the action, uh, uh, the name of the action is Camino. It's an open innovation program uh, with the objective of supporting 100 Moroccan start startups uh, while promoting entrepreneurship and employability of young people in the rural world. So uh, the group took the initiative to, uh, to, to, to mentor and to, to, to guide uh, and to support ca uh, young people uh, interested by launching uh, their small projects in the in the agricultural uh, field or, or in another field. So the, the main thing or the main thing, the, the main uh, idea is to uh, launch a project and the group was responsible of uh, supporting uh, this project. So uh, 
as I said, the group is always on the move. Uh, its uh, goal is to combine digital and social innovation, thinking of tools, for example, that could solve the most problems that uh, the most problems of a farmer, and uh, contributing to the financial inclusion and also making uh, the banking services accessible to. Uh, everyone, everywhere, and mainly to the farmers in uh, installed in the uh, rural regions. So to conclude, uh, I, I will say that uh, we know that every day by exercising and being in a direct contact with the digital field, we confirm that artificial intelligence continue to contribute to the development and the emergence of practices not only within companies but also at the social level. It, which means that artificial intelligence contributes, it's an innovation and contributes to innovation and all its types. Uh, but we should note that since AI is for the best, it is also uh, not without the worst. And one question can open us to several. Uh, we, we, nothing can guarantee that uh, even if a even if uh, artificial intelligence is powerful, uh, it can push us, push us at the reflection uh, to say that uh, it might reduce, uh, it might increase uh, the misery of a human, or it might uh, contribute to the discriminations and injustices. And uh, also, uh, would AI be able one day to replace humans in 100% and have the ultimate power? Uh, so uh, those are some questions that uh, can uh, can uh, create the discussion. Uh, artificial intelligence is raising more and more hopes, uh, but uh, nothing can guarantee uh, its good points and uh, its bad points. So uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, and I want also to thank to to thank the organizing organizing committee for its efforts and uh, uh, the whole organization of the conference. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Hamers. I'm a PhD student at the University of Ghent in Belgium, and I will be presenting the paper called The Hardware and Control Co-Design Enabled by State Space Formulation of Cascaded Interconnected PID Control Systems. First I'll go to the contents, so I'll start with the problem statement, and I will talk about the main goal, then I'll present the general optimization methodology, after which there will be a validation case, which is a mechanical synchronization case, and I'll end this presentation with some general conclusions. First, the problem statement. So, the multidisciplinary nature of today's machines means that different engineering teams must work together to achieve a competitive system design. We have, on the one hand, the hardware engineer that has to make choices on, for instance, the hardware assembly, the type of hardware, and the placement within the system. After that, the control engineer establishes the control schemes and has to make choices on the control strategies and the controller tuning properties. Both the hardware design and the controller design have an important influence on the total system performance, but today we see that they are mostly considered as separate design steps with each part having different objectives and limitations. And this leads to what we call an industrial design gap. In other words, there is a lack of tools to simultaneously consider the hardware and control aspects to achieve optimal system design. So this is also the goal of the code design that we want to perform. So we have the code design of the system composition and with that we want to simultaneously optimize the actuator and sensor placement. So these are binaries defining the hardware presence or absence. Also the actuator and sensor selection. These are integers defining the hardware type together with the control architecture. So these are binaries defining different control architecture features. And uh, last but not least, we also want to simultaneously optimize the controller parameters, which are real numbers defining the optimal controller tuning. We want to do that to minimize a discontinuous fitness function. This can be related to, for instance, settling time, tracking error, vibration control or energy consumption, and also in accordance with nonlinear constraints, 
related to, for instance, the hardware costs, the maximum control efforts, the control complexity costs, or even motion tolerances. So, um, as with every optimization, we need an optimization algorithm. And for this optimization methodology, um, we chose the genetic algorithm to be most appropriate. Um, it has some advantages. Uh, for instance, it can cope with the discontinuous fitness functions, also with nonlinear constraint functions, and it can handle mixed integer design parameters, but it also has some uh, drawbacks. So for instance, it is a non-deterministic approach. So that means that even for the same starting conditions, different solutions can be obtained. And another big drawback of applying a genetic algorithm is that it is computationally expensive. A solution is found by iteratively changing the design parameters, calculating the system response, and checking if the fitness value of the individuals become better or not. And this means that a large number of response calculations need to be calculated. This also means that the genetic algorithm optimization time can be drastically reduced if the calculation time for one individual response is reduced. And this is exactly the main idea of the presented paper, as I will show you. So we see at the left-hand side a graphical overview of the workflow to perform the hardware and control co-design optimization. The workflow starts with a model description and first the design space for the actuators and sensors is defined, after which an open loop state space system is obtained. Next, an open loop analysis is performed and during this open loop analysis, the feasibility of all different hardware configurations can be determined efficiently without a need to calculate a closed loop response. This information can be used during the genetic algorithm optimization so that no time is lost in calculating the system response of these predetermined and feasible hardware configurations. A second important extension is to describe the system dynamics with various interconnected control loops as one single state space system representation. This can be seen on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, so we see an open loop state space system with an observer and an extensive control feedback system that can be formulated as a single closed loop state space system using the presented closed loop state space methodology. The control feedback system can comprise of an observer system with cascaded, decentralized and distributed controllers, synchronizing control and feed forward control. Now I won't go into further detail for this presentation, but more information on the closed loop state space methodology can be found in the presented paper. As a result, the closed loop system response based on external inputs and disturbances can be computed much faster compared to existing methods used to describe extensive control loops. This time gain is not so important for one single response calculation, but it results in a considerable time gain when using a genetic algorithm optimization that typically needs a large number of response calculations to obtain a solution, as I mentioned before. That is why the closed loop state space methodology actually enables the hardware and control co-design of cascaded interconnected PID controlled systems within a reasonable time. The result of the proposed co-design method is a Pareto analysis that provides a clear understanding in the inevitable trade-off between the total implementation cost and the maximum achievable system performance. And it is clear that this provides very valuable insights for the design engineer. So next I will show the application of this methodology to a mechanical synchronization case. This case is a generic LTI model that consists of three dynamically coupled inertias. So we have a central load inertia with actuator inertias on both sides. This generic model can represent various practical examples such as a molten steel ladle or an overhead gantry crane. The objective function is to uh, achieve motion control, vibration control, and synchronization control for a reference trajectory with load torque disturbances. We have several design variables. So we have two actuator selection integers, two sensor selection integers, seven control architecture binaries, and 32 controller tuning parameters. So for the open loop state space system, we have um, six states, three outputs, three inputs, I also show the state matrix A. We also have the input matrix B, the open loop output matrix C, and the open loop feed through matrix D. Now, the goal is to obtain one single closed loop state space system of the open loop system, as I mentioned before, together with the extensive control feedback system. 
So this results in a, a, a more extensive closed loop state space system. Uh, once again, I won't show the details, but I'll show the results or the main results. So we have for the closed loop system, a system with 32 states, the same six outputs. Then we have 10 inputs and we also see that the dimensions of the state matrix A, uh, input matrix B, output matrix C and feed through matrix D are shown here on the slides. Next, the time savings of the proposed methodology are demonstrated by comparing the simulation time of the model with MATLAB Simulink versus the proposed closed-loop state space methodology. 1000 simulations are performed with a simulation time of 30 seconds and a sample time of 0.01 seconds, each with different random controller values. The total calculation time using MATLAB Simulink is 3477 seconds. And next, the response is calculated on the same CPU for the same set of 1000 different controller value combinations using the proposed closed loop state space methodology. This leads to a total calculation time of 36 seconds. This shows that the calculation of 1000 simulations is approximately 95 times faster with the proposed methodology, which is of course a very nice result. Next, the hardware and control co-design optimization is performed and the optimization results with the different Pareto points are depicted in the table while the Pareto front itself is shown in the top left side. The fitness value is the quantification of the objective and in other words it describes how good a particular system composition behaves according to the intended objective function. As you can see, as more implementation cost is available, more control architecture features and better hardware components can be implemented. And um, also important to note is that also the controller tuning parameters are optimized, but they are not shown in the table because of uh, space restrictions. In the lower left side, the displacement response and the corresponding actuator effort is shown for the different Pareto points, showing that the performance increases as more implementation cost is allowed. So this was the validation case. I'll uh, head on to the general conclusions. So we established a methodology for the simultaneous co-design of the hardware architecture and the control configuration, by which we mean that the hardware architecture is the placement and selection of actuators and sensors, and the control configuration is the control architecture optimization and the controller tuning parameter optimization. This was done for different discontinuous objectives and with respect to various nonlinear constraints. And we also added some extensions to achieve an efficient optimization workflow. So first of all, there's the open loop analysis, but more importantly, there's the closed loop state space methodology, which is the main topic of the presented paper. Then the resulting Pareto front provides valuable insights into the trade-off between the performance and the costs. And also we believe that there is a very broad implementation range. So for this application, we uh, mainly focused on the mechatronic system, but it can also be used for electrical, thermal, or even chemical processes. So this was my paper presentation. As mentioned before, more details can be found in the paper itself, and you can always send me an email for further questions. Thank you. Bye. Hello everyone, my name is Yu Liang. I'm a PhD student at Gen National Jiao Tong University in Taiwan. Today I'm going to present the joint replenishment problem with cycle time constraints under general integer policy. So first of all, I will introduce what is a joint replenishment problem, JRP, and then I'll talk about the cycle time constraints, which is new to the JRP research area. And the next, I will discuss how we develop an efficient and effective solution approach to solve it. Last is the summary. So first of all, a joint replenishment problem is to coordinate a group of items. So the number of items is more than one and they may be ordered jointly. So that's why you call it a joint replenishment problem. There are two types of setup costs. The first one is the major setup cost, A0. It is incurred whenever any item is ordered. The second one is the minor setup cost, AI. It's incurred when any item I is replenished. The main feature of the JRP is that the cycle time for each item, TI, 
is equals to a positive integer ki times a basic cycle time b. For example, if b is a week, then the ti will be one week, two weeks, three weeks, and so on. The reason is that if we organize the um, cycle time in this pattern, then the items can share the major setup costs. For example, in this figure, um, each color means a cycle time for an item. So if we use joint replenishment, then we only have to order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times and pay seven times of major setup cost. On the other hand, we might need to pay nine times of major setup costs. The major setup cost is expensive in some of the industries like pharmaceutical, chemistry, process, and textile companies. So if we can uh, share the major setup cost, then we can, we can lower our costs. The goal of the joint replenishment is to minimize the average setup cost and inventory hosting cost per unit of time. So let's look at a real life example. So consider in the VMI system of the supplier uh, takes charge of the uh, replenishment for different types of items. So in this example, different packages of Coke. So for each item, there is a minor setup cost, AI, the demand rate, DI, and a holding cost, HI. Besides, every time the supplier places an order, it will cost him a major setup cost, A0. The, the cycle time for each item is KI times B. The objective is to minimize the average total cost, including major setup cost, minor setup cost, and the holding cost of all items. So uh, in our study, we further add a, a cycle time constraint, uh, lower bound LI and upper bound UI, because each item might have a lead time to uh, receive that order and a shelf life. So this is our literature review. There are only a few studies working work on the JRP with constraints. One of them is the Porras and Decker in 2006. They only consider the minimum order quantity constraints, which can be transformed to the lower bound of cycle time in our study. And uh, the second one is Hulk. 2006, they consider the limitation of capital investment and the storage capacity. And the, since the demand rate is constant for each item, so all these constraints can uh, transform to a, a lower bound or upper bound in our study. So our study consider um, not only the lower bound and upper bound for the cycle time, but can be extended to other types of constraints. For the theoretical analysis and the proposed algorithm, we followed the, the method in Li and Yao 2003. However, they used the power of two policy, which means all the KIs are uh, power of two, like one, two, four, eight. Uh, but not a general integer, and they don't consider any of the constraints. So here are the notations and assumptions. We've already introduced them in the Coke example. The assumptions uh, are pretty much the same as the EOQ model, except the cycle time Ti is equals to a positive integer Ki times a basic cycle time B. So this is our mathematical model. The goal is to minimize the average total cost, including the major setup cost, and for each item, the minor setup cost and holding cost. The cycle time is restricted to a lower bound LI 
and upper bound UI. Since Ki is a positive integer and B is uh, greater than zero, this model is a mixed integer nonlinear programming problem. For each item of I, this is the average total cost. And based on the minor setup cost, holding cost, and uh, demand rate, we can categorize the items into four types. The first type is type one. Given the lower bound and upper bound, we know the average total cost is a function of basic cycle time B. And given diff different values of K, we can have this plot. So the blue line is K equals to one. This is K equals to two and K equals to three. Uh, when we want to find a minimum of the average total cost, we search along the X, B axis. And uh, from this figure, we know we only have to consider the, the, the intervals here and this interval and this intervals. In type two, the um, structure is more complicated because under different values of K, the average total cost function has intersections. So from our study, we know we only have to consider the uh, basic cycle, cycle time in the range of this term and this term. For type three, the intervals for basic side cold time B is mainly determined by the upper bound UI. And on the other hand, in type four, the basic cycle time search range is determined by the lower bound LI. So this is the framework of our proposed, proposed algorithm. Say, now we have two items. The first item is in blue under different values of case, and the second item is in green. So when we add them up, then the, this is our total cost. In each interval, we know the optimal value of case for each item. Like in this interval, uh, optimal K is K1 equals to two and K1, K2 equals to one. So our search direction is from the highest value of B to the lowest value of B. After search in each intervals of uh, each intervals, and we can have the local optimum solution. Comparing all of them, then we can get a global optimum solution. And this is the descriptions and details of our proposed algorithm. In summary, this study uh, is considered a JRP under cycle time constraints, which can be extended to many other constraints like minimum order quantity, MOQ, budget, and storage limitation, as in our upper bound. Uh, Second, based on our theoretical analysis on the optimality solution structures, we categorize the items into four types and uh, discuss the uh, optimal solution. Last, the global search algorithm is proposed to obtain a global optimal solution efficiently. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Yusuf Moumani. I am a PhD student in National School of Applied Sciences, Advanced Systems Engineering Laboratory, Ibn Tufayl University, Qnitra, Morocco. I am glad to participate in the seventh edition of the International Conference on Optimization and Applications held in Ostfalia University of Applied Sciences, Wolfenbüttel, Germany. I am going to present and share with you modeling and bug stepping control of DFIG used in wind energy conversion system. This presentation will cover the following parts. We'll start by context the, and then the modeling strategy and then the bug stepping controller and uh, 
After that, the simulation results will be analyzed and discussed. Finally, we'll finish by conclusion. As you can see here in this schematic diagram of uh, wind turbine based on DFIG, you can see that the wind turbine consists on a three-bladed horizontal axis wind turbine and the gearbox system and the generator the FIG double feed induction generator which is the most widely used generator in uh, wind turbines as you can see here the stator windings of the generator are directly connected to the grid through this step up transformer whereas the rotor windings are connected to the grid through these two power electronic converters the RAC, the rotor side converter and the GEC, the, the, the grid side converter and uh, uh, three phase, a three phase filter so the aim of our study is to control the rotor side converter by using backstepping control strategy in order to maximize the power extracted from wind turbine in order to do that we have to to model the wind turbine including the beer box and to model also the DFIG the double feed induction generator before designing the backstepping controller so we will start by the modeling of the the wind turbine the wind turbine is uh, to, to extract the maximum power the, the maximum power from wind turbine the power coefficient CP should be at its maximum uh, at its maximum value which is 0 0.5 uh, 0 0.50 50, 59 which is which is called bits limit this power coefficient tells us how much how efficient the wind turbine is this power coefficient depends on lambda which is the tip speed ratio and beta which is the pitch angle so in order to have the maximum value of CP we have the, the, the lambda the, the tip speed ratio should be at its optimum value so to keep this optimum value of lambda we have to control the speed because lambda depends on the speed of the wind turbine and to control the speed we're gonna have to control the torque this algorithm is called max MPPT algorithm maximum power point tracking algorithm we have to take into consideration in more in the to wind turbine model uh, if we went uh, bef before before designing the backstepping control this algorithm so after designing after modeling the wind turbine we have to model the DFIG the double feed induction generator used uh, by, by uh, we can, uh, this figure shows us the shows the the model of the DFIG as you can see here that the, this model is the, the, the DFIG is consisted by two subsystems the first subsystem has as an output the active power PS which is controlled by IRQ the rotor current which is controlled by the rotor voltage and the second the second subsystem the equations of the second set has as an output the reactive power uh, controlled by IRD the, uh, the direct component of the rotor current in the DQ reference frame which is controlled by VRD so in order to control we so here we can we can control the the active and the reactive power by controlling the rotor voltages so in order to make the, uh, the in order to design the backstepping controller which is a, which is a nonlinear recursive uh, recursive uh, method, nonlinear method, n recursive method. We have to design, we have to determine the IRQ reference and IRD reference in the first step. This is the first step, and in the second step, 
we have to define the references of the rotor voltage in order to have the maximum power uh, and to control the reactive power exchanges between the DFIG and the grid. In the to determine IRQ reference and IRD reference, in this first step, we have to follow these, this algorithm. So we have to find, to calculate the errors, the errors between the measured power, active power and its reference, and the same for the reactive power, the, re the error between the measured value and its reference, and then we, de we determine the Lyapunov functions. The Ly each Lyapunov function should be positive, and its derivative should be negative, in order to ensure the stability of the system according to Lyapunov theory. After defining the, the Lyapunov functions, we have to, de to determine the derivative of Lyapunov functions, and we can, f we can see here that the derivative of Lyapunov functions depends on the, on the currents. So we have to, to choose these currents in a such way that the, these derivatives are, are, are should, be, should be negative. In order to be negative, we have to choose these parameters C1, C3 as positive parameters. They have to be chosen, they, they should be, they should be chosen uh, in a, in a pro they should be properly chosen in order to have the derivative of Lyapunov functions negative. The same for the second, the second step. The second step to, ha to, to determine the, the, the references of the voltage, we have to follow the same steps. We have to calculate the errors, the Lyapunov functions, derivative of Lyapunov functions, and so on. So, after designing this controller, we simulate this controller in a uh, MATLAB simulink environment by applying a typical wind speed profile, which is this one, this one, and um, we find that the tip speed ratio is equal to 8, and the power coefficient CP is equal to 0 0.56. 0 Appro approximately, it's the maximum value of CP. So we have the maximum power extracted from wind turbine. This is exactly how we could we c we uh, we c uh, we could at we can achieve the m the the we can apply the MPPT algorithm by using this backstepping controller. And he here we have the st the stator currents and the rotor currents generated by the DFIG, which changes with the power, because the power changes, uh, because we have here the power changes with the changes of the wind speed, and here we have the, t the stator uh, reactive power. The stator reactive power converges to zero. This is a very interesting part. When the uh, reactive power converges to zero, which means we have a unitary power factor. In conclusion, we can say that this backstepping control strategy proposed in this work is an effective, is one of the of, 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 uh, uh, of uh, nonlinear control strategies that is effective to control the rotor side converter in order to maximize and optimize the power extracted from wind turbine and to, con it's, uh, and to control also the reactive power to have a unitary power factor it has also a high performances in terms of robustness against both the wind speed variations and parametric variations compared to other classical nonlinear uh, classical linear controllers such as PI controller. This is the end of this presentation. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you again for your patience. Hello, my name is Aisha Ramjahdi. I am PhD student in Laboratory of Systems Engineering and Decision Making Support, National School of Applied Sciences, Ibn Zohr University. In this session, I will present my work entitled Overall performance indicators for sustainability assessment and management in mining industry. The mining industry plays a significant role in the global economy. 
However, it is an important source of pollution and resource consumption. Thus, implementing a sustainable approach through an overall performance integration in manufacturing practices it became a necessity in this industry. So, what is the overall performance? The overall performance uh, is defined as the aggregation of economic, social and environmental performances. The idea of overall performance has emerged over the last decades and is mobilized to assess the implementation and the system of the sustainability concept in the manufacturing process by companies. Many researchers confirm that this initiative can be triggered by several concrete and potential benefits such as cost uh, reduction, increased customer satisfaction, enhanced profit realization, improved market position and corporate image. The company can also consider this sustainable strategy as one of the main drivers of innovation and competitiveness. The objective of this work is to propose a set of key performance indicators for overall performance evaluation and management in mining industry. For this purpose, we first carried out a literature review to identify the key performance indicators based on the three pillars of sustainability of social, environmental and economic. The KPIs are then investigated through a survey that was conducted in a Moroccan mining industry to confirm their adaptability with the industry practices. The performance indicators can be defined as the physical values and measures which are utilized to evaluate, compare and pilot performance for, of an organization. Thus, research in sustainable performance evaluation and management has increased rapidly during the past uh, recent few years. In our work, we focus especially on the last seven years to get an idea of the latest research in the field. We chose to establish the initial KPIs from the re recent literature that proved the implementation of KPIs in manufacturing, as, as described in Helena Oyol, and from the, la the latest uh, literature review articles that derived KPIs from different previous applications in industrial systems, like what was advocated in Helena Oyol. The present table describes the results of our analysis of 15 articles. We have considered the most cited and used indica indicators in the literature to form our in initial KPIs. Therefore, our set of indicators consists of three dimensions of economic, environmental and social, with 18 indicators in total as shown in the table. We have seven measures for economic dimension, six measures for environmental dimension, and five measures for social dimension. In order to validate the established initial KPIs in mining industry, a survey was conducted to a mining manufacturing company located in Morocco. Founded in 1920, the company is Morocco's largest mining group, with four mine sites and a 2018 turnover of $5.5 billion. The firm has been certified by ISO 45001, ISO 9001, and ISO 14001. For this study, a questionnaire was dis distributed to a total of 12 managers, three from each site, in production division, in order to investigate the established KPIs on the basis of their firm's practices and their personal experiences. The respondents were asked to rate their level of importance of each KPI using a four-point Likert scale ranging from one not important to four very important. The present table shows the mean importance of each indicator ranged from 2.9 to 4. 
The results show that injury rate is considered as the most important indicator of overall performance in mining industry with mean importance value of 4, followed by occupational health and safety with a mean importance value of 3.98. This reveals that the mining industry in Morocco focuses more on the social dimension while evaluating firms' overall performance. This can be re explained by the social responsibility approach that mining companies in Morocco put in their priorities to develop their att attractiveness and strengthen their uh, competitiveness and foreign direct investments. Other indicators are respectively total energy consumption as third important indicator, quality of products and services as fourth important indicator, and net profits and total water consumption as fifth important indicators with same mean uh, importance value of 3.5. This is not unexpected since uh, the company is a leader in mining sector and its uh, high perception of quality and net profit is inevitable. Uh, similarly, it is evident that environmental dimension in, is given an important concern while the nature of this activity requires a large amount of energy and water. Uh, however, environmental certification, labor costs, and disposal of waste are considered the least important indicators for overall performance evaluation in mining industry. The reason for this is probably the project manager's priorities in mining projects. They tend to put more focus uh, on performance indica indicators related directly to the project, like quality and give less concern to performance issues and directly related to their project's management objectives. In light of the results, the initial KPIs have been changed. Environmental certification, labor costs, and disposal of waste were removed from the established uh, initial KPIs because of their less importance in mining industry. Therefore, as presented in the figure, three dimensions with a total of 15 indicators have been suggested as the KPIs for overall performance evaluation in mining industry. Six measures for economic dimension, four measures for environmental dimension, and five measures for social dimension. So, in this work, a set of overall performance indicators was defined to facilitate the evaluation and the integration of sustainability in mining industry. These KPIs were derived from recent research about sustainable manufacturing application in industry. They were then examined using a survey in a Moroccan mining industry to validate their adaptability to its practices and processes. So this study will be helpful for mining organization in, in order to select the KPIs for their uh, overall performance management. Our proposition in an ongoing work is to develop uh, an evaluation model based on the established KPIs for mining industry. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Hajar Dubabi and I'm a PhD student at Trans University in France and Qadayad University in Morocco. Today, I'd like to present my accepted paper at the International Conference on Optimization and Applications 2021, which is titled A Reliable Power Management Strategy of a PV-Based Electric Scooters Charging Station. This presentation is divided into five main sections. The introduction, description of the solar powered scooters charging station prototype, proposed power management strategy, simulation results and discussions, the conclusion. 
Nowadays, the impending exhaustion of fossil fuel reserves, climate change, and global warming are considered the most serious environmental issues we face. The transport sector is one of the largest contributors to these issues. The number of motorbikes on the road are increasing day by day due to their affordable price and their convenience of use and parking. However, according to an international research study carried out by the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, Motorbikes are ecologically harmful as they emit toxic emissions and cause more air pollution than cars. Therefore, the shift toward transport electrification can provide a holistic solution to these issues. The electric scooter is clean, noise-free, and efficient, so it appears to be the best alternative for replacing the conventional gasoline motorcycle. With the fast progress in battery technology, the e-scooter market is expanding annually. However, the lack of public charging infrastructure could be one of the main hindrances to further penetrate the vehicle market. For that reason, why more charging facilities will be needed in public places. Further, the electricity for charging e-scooters must be generated by renewable energy sources to alleviate the heavy pressure on local distrib distribution grids and meet the sustainable pollution-free e-mobility. In this regard, a self-contained solar-powered charging station prototype for e-scooters has been built at Qadayad University in Morocco. The system was designed for charging the e-scooters of, of the student as they are parked during the day. The structure of this charging station is based on PV panels that generate power in a green manner. So let's introduce the main elements of this station. Fifteen photovoltaic modules are used for the power generation. The specifications of one module are given in the table one. They are located on the rooftop of the building and oriented south with an angle of 28 degree. The installed power achieved is 3.9 kilowatt. An inverter equipped with compliant data logger to easily re record and read live inverter operating data in a platform via internet. A 5.3 kilowatt hour plumb acid battery bank is incorporated in the charging station to ensure a charging station completely independent of the grid. Plumb acid batteries were chosen owing to their reliability and lower cost compared to other types. During the year of 2019, the monthly energy yield of the implemented PVRI is plotted as illustrated in this figure. As can be seen, the power yield varies from January to December depending on the season. From this collected data, we can calculate the total annual production as well as the total amount of the avoided CO2 emissions using uh, this equation. So, the implemented charging station can limit nearly 1,154.2 kg per year of CO2 emissions, which is an attractive number. The structure schematic of our solar-powered e-scooters charging station can be provided as follows. This charging station is a microgrid that operates in islanded mode. A shared DC bus is used for interlinking the different elements of the station. Three types of power converter are used. 
a step up DC DC converter for the PVRI, a bidirectional DC DC converter for the battery storage, and DC AC converters for the power transfer of A to H e scooter. A maximum power point tracking or MPPT controller is also used to extract the maximum energy from the PVRI. The energy management system or EMS collects information and sends control signal to the station element according to the executed algorithm, which can guarantee optimal e scooter battery charging. This is the flowchart of the po proposed power management strategy for our solar station prototype. First, we perform a load detection test by identifying if an e-scooter is placed on top of the charging pad using the load's presence detectors. If no e-scooter is connected, the produced PV energy is used to charge the battery storage as long as its SOC is lower than 90%. Otherwise, if an e-scooter is connected to the station, then we should identify the power of loads below to supply the required energy. When the demand is lower than the PV system production, then e-scooters get fully charged and the excess of energy is fed into the battery storage. When the PV power is not enough, the e-scooters get charged from the PV system in conjunction with the battery storage. If the battery storage is discharged, then the maximum SOC load or state of charge of the load is set to 80%. When neither the PV energy is enough nor the battery storage charge is sufficient, for example, the case of heavily cloudy day, loads are then disconnected. Nevertheless, this case is infrequent in Marrakech City. In order to evaluate the performance of the proposed power management algorithm, simulations have been carried out using MATLAB simulating environment to experience different operation modes of the station under different weather conditions. We are examined two scenarios. For scenarios, we plotted the profiles of PV power power and state of charge of the battery storage, uh, the delivered power to the loads, and the DC bus voltage. The PV power curve is a real profile registered via data logger of the station. At the beginning of all tests, the battery storage is considered not fully charged, assuming that it was used for e-scooters charging the day before when PV power is absent after sunset. The number of e-scooters connected to the station generally varies during the day, which is also taken into account in simulations. The DC bus voltage is regulated regardless of the load variations using a PID controller. It is also important to mention that the charging pads of station are used during work hours. Therefore, the station operation is investigated for 10 to 12 working hours per day in simulations. So here, for a typical sunny day on spring season, May 5, 2019, the simulation results are presented as follow. As can be seen, from 7 to 8.30, the PV power is not enough for charging the six connected e-scooters. Therefore, the battery is used to meet all loads the demand for this five hours after. The loads are all supplied from the PV system and the excess of solar energy is stored on the batteries. Once the batteries are fully charged, the PV power was sufficient to charge the e-scooters over the afternoon until 17. Then, the battery power 
is also used. The resulted profile for a day on winter season January uh, 27, 2019 are illustrated in these figures. During the first hour, the PV power is almost zero. Thus, the battery is used to compensate the PV energy. Once the sun irradiance is existing, the PV system produces energy to charge the e-scooter as well as the battery storage. During winter season, the day is short and the sunset is earlier, hence the PV system production stops at 18.30 and the battery storage continues to discharge in order to meet the load's demand. In this presentation, uh, I firstly introduced the design of a solar-powered charging station prototype for e-scooters at Qadayyad University in Marrakech, Morocco. Then, I described the main components of the station in order to monitor correctly the power flow between the station elements. We developed an energy management strategy and then it was validated through simulations in MATLAB Simulink. The obtained results showed how the charging station can meet optimal e-scooters charging according to the daily available energy. Thank you.